Welcome, and uh, I appreciate you all logging in today. Welcome to another episode of Northern Virginia Family Practices uh, Town Hall, and I uh, hope you're in the right place uh, because uh, it's, you're going to be a little bored or disappointed if you're looking for something else here. So, um, uh, I'm Dr. Zweig. Oh, here we go. Here's a lot more people coming on. Great. Right. So it looks like a few more just logged in. Um, so I'm Dr. Zweig, and um, just uh, wanted to give a few announcements before we go ahead and get started. Uh, as you probably all know, uh, we're finally in our new office at 2445 Army Navy Drive. Uh, please uh, don't go to the old office. Uh, you will not find anybody there. So uh, we just opened up today. It was our first day. Uh, it's still a work in progress. We have uh, some more cleaning and putting things up, but it's it's looking very good. And we are uh, able to see patients there and uh, also do telemedicine. So um, feel free to make appointments or even just stop by and say hi and take a look at the new office. But uh, we are there and uh, ready to see you. So that's great. Um, also, just want to let you know that uh, we still do highly recommend getting the COVID boosters this fall and the flu vaccine, uh, and we recommend them for everybody, um, but certainly uh, for people who are high risk. Um, so please get those. We will have the flu vaccine at some point, though, because of the move, it's on hold, and we're hoping to get the COVID vaccine if you just need to get it at the local pharmacy, that's fine too. We don't care where you get it. We don't get jealous. Uh, we just want you to get it. Uh, you can also consider the RSV vaccine if you're at higher risk. Um, it's very new, so uh, we don't know a whole lot about it, but it looks like it's probably very good. And uh, so if you do qualify for it, that's something else you could get at uh, the local pharmacy as well. Um, but our main event today is about immunotherapy, as you uh, were hoping to see here. So we have today, uh, we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Jacob Ninen, uh, who is a local oncologist uh, who, that uh, we use very regularly. Uh, we all send a lot of our patients to him. He is a terrific uh, physician, uh, and anybody who has seen him, I think, would readily agree. Um, so Dr. Ninen attended Northwestern University for his undergrad degree uh, and then uh, happily went to my alma mater, the University of Michigan, for medical school. Uh, he, after completing medical school, then went on to do his residency at the University of Wisconsin um, and uh, also stayed on there to do a fellowship in oncology. Uh, and he currently practices in Alexandria with the Virginia Cancer, Spel Virginia Cancer Specialists um, and has a special interest in hematologic malignancies as well as lung cancers. And so we're very excited to have Dr. Ninan talk to us today. And he's going to be talking to us about the new field of immunotherapy for cancer treatments. So without further ado, take it away, Dr. Ninan. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Pleasure. All right. I'm going to get right into my slides. start at the beginning. Excuse me. Perfect. Can you all see that? Great. Good. Perfect. So uh, immunotherapy, uh, just to let you know, before we start, the, the picture that you're seeing here is a scanning electron microscope uh, colorized picture of a cancer cell being attacked by T cells. That's going to be the theme of this going down. So you'll see a couple uh, of other pictures of this. This is not a comprehensive lecture. This is sort of an introduction to immunotherapy. Uh, the The field is is big and getting bigger, like almost literally every day. So, and because I don't know exactly who's listening, uh, we're going to start with the basics of oncology. What treatments do we use now? And then what's the next step? And and uh, we'll be talking about immunotherapy thereafter. So this is a busy slide, but all you need to know is that since 1863, we've been uh, working on how to treat cancers. And so uh, we've spent a very long time with a lot of big milestones uh, over the many uh, 120 plus years. And uh, just to point out, uh, this chart also has these percentages here, and that's the relative survival rate for patients with uh, cancer. Uh, so ba oops, uh, back in 1953, it was 35%. Uh, in the 70s, it was 50%. And in 2005, it's uh, up to 68%. So we continue to improve on that. 2005 was also the first uh, decrease in total number of uh, deaths from cancer. So big milestone and, and these uh, milestones continue to uh, improve. So just to step back and, and how do we treat cancers in general? Uh, this is a uh, this picture here is a, a dividing cancer cell. It looks terrible. 
Um, but the really how we treat cancers right now uh, in modern medicine is, is with a multimodality approach using surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. I'm uh, an oncologist, and so I do the chemotherapy part. There's a separate field of radiation oncology, and of course, there are uh, surgeons as well. All of us sort of decide uh, what we need to do uh, based on each uh, patient uh, in front of us. Earlier stage cancers tend to be uh, treated more with surgery and radiation. Uh, we uh, oncologists will come in after the fact and say, well, uh, the data shows that maybe a little bit of chemotherapy would be beneficial to reduce risk of recurrence, and that's called adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, or I like to call it insurance policy chemotherapy, just to make sure that we're uh, uh, giving you the best chance of not having cancer come back. Later stage cancers, uh, the staging indicates that cancer cells are moving out of the original location to another location like lymph nodes or other organs. And so we rely more on chemotherapy, systemic tr uh, treatments uh, to treat uh, microscopic disease. Uh, so the term chemotherapy has a lot of uh, connotations in, in people's minds. Really to us, oncologists, chemotherapy can encompass all the treatments that, that we use, meaning uh, anything that we use uh, to treat systemically. In this talk, uh, the sort of the old style chemotherapy, I'll refer to as conventional chemotherapy. Uh, even though everyone has this connotation of chemotherapy being terrible, we've actually gotten really uh, a lot better at uh, uh, treating patients and uh, making it much more tolerable. Uh, you know, we've had 50 plus years of refining these regimens and, and making doses so they're, they're both effective and tolerable. And so uh, this slide here just talks, us a little, talks to us a little bit about what conventional chemotherapy is. So the, the chemotherapy that we've been using up until around 2000 or so. Uh, this is a cancer cell. So uh, this is a regular cell division. And for some reason, a mutation happened. And these cells are unregulated and just divide more and more and make more of themselves. That's essentially all cancer is. This is a regular body cell that, that doesn't divide. So it's not dividing all the time, unlike these cancer cells. So the first treatments of uh, cancer were to say, well, how do we stop this division? So the old chemotherapies used to affect actively dividing cells uh, preferentially. And so uh, those cancer cells don't have the repair mechanisms that our normal cells do. So our, our healthy cells, if they happen to be dividing during the time the chemotherapy is in your system, uh, they will recover eventually, not necessarily immediately. But that's why we have the side effects like hair loss and nausea, because that's your GI tract or your hair follicles that were in a state of division uh, at the time. Those will regenerate and recover, um, but the, the, we rely on the treatments to keep the cancer cells from doing that. Uh, and, and the reason why we have to do multiple uh, treatments of chemotherapy is because at any one point, a cancer cell may not be dividing. And so we say, well, let's uh, treat it three weeks later, and hopefully we'll get those cells that weren't treated the first time. So that's how regimens are made, and that's how timing is uh, for these regimens is uh, developed. And so this was pre-2000. So that was sort of how we treated all cancers uh, with uh, just standard chemotherapy. And then uh, as we started to find out more about cancer cells, uh, we learned more, uh, had better testing, had better imaging, and we could find targets on cancer cells. So things that you may have heard of, the most famous one is this HER2 receptor on certain breast cancers. Uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, we can use a drug called uh, trastuzumab that uh, select selectively hits those HER2 uh, receptors on those cancer cells. Another one that we use a lot in hematology is this uh, CD20 uh, uh, receptor agent called rituxan. Uh, we use that along with other chemotherapies to treat B cell lymphomas. So these are directed against B cells specifically, so they spare a lot of your other cells. Uh, there's not really a lot of side effects with these medicines, but they're ineffective on their own. So we have to use them with standard chemotherapies. And so that was in the early 2000s. That's what, what we used for uh, almost all of our therapies. We started adding new agents once we knew about, uh, we learned about uh, different receptors. So the next step from 2000 to now is uh, what we call precision medicine. Uh, NGS stands for next generation sequencing. And so what we're seeing uh, with that is 
For example, this EGFR uh, receptor, this here, was discovered in 1979, but we didn't really know what it did. In 2004, we realized that when uh, in cancer patients, lung cancer patients specifically, when this uh, dimerization happened, uh, it allowed the cells to proliferate. So the, the patients with this mutation would have this dimerization happen on the cell surface, and then that would uh, uh, start all of these pathways to cause cell growth. That, that was that mutation in those lung cancer cells. And so we developed agents that block these receptor sites at you know, various uh, points, uh, erlotinib, osimertinib, afatinib, jafitinib. These were all agents that uh, don't necessarily affect regular cells. They just affect the cells that have this EGFR receptor on it, which are the cancer cells. And so the side effects are, are much less uh, compared to standard chemotherapies. And for example, in patients with metastatic lung cancer, I can now treat them with a pill just like their uh, blood pressure or their lipid uh, medicines. It's a pill that they take every day uh, and they tolerate it very well. And so we continue to improve on all of these things. The problem is not all cancers have these types of mutations. And so these are some mutations that we know about. And just to look at this uh, side of the, the chart, um, these red arrows are mutations that we have for lung cancer that we have targets against. There are a lot of different types of mutations that we know about. Some of them are different uh, numbers of genes, some are different gene fusions, but uh, we're learning more about all of these and we don't have drugs for all of these mutations, but uh, I assure you they're probably uh, working on them. And Dr. Nina has memorized yeah. all of those mutations. So if yeah, that's right. questions at the end, uh, you can put that in the chat. He'll be happy to answer. That's that. right. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll tell you that there are more mutations. Uh, uh, again, we were talking about this uh, beforehand. Keeping up with the new drugs and the new mutations is really difficult. And it's great because, you know, my email inbox every morning has something new in it for me to learn about. So it uh, keeps me on my toes. So where this talk is about immunology, we've talked about the oncology part of this. We do need to talk a little bit about immunology just to figure out what immunotherapy is. And so uh, immunology is, uh, is a massive field. It was a, you know, a whole lecture class in our medical school that uh, we learned for a whole year. It's extremely complex. And to be honest, we didn't really understand it until the past 20 years, and we're still learning a lot more all the time. The basic thing for, for all of this, uh, the take-home point is that T lymphocytes are cells that try to identify our own cells from other cells, and they help kill other cells. And so the basis of immunotherapy is how do we get those cells to recognize cancer cells as others? So just an overview of the immune system, we have uh, the innate in immune response and adaptive immune response. But all this means is innate just means that these macrophages are cells that recognize abnormal cells and will uh, swallow them up. And so that's what uh, you see here. And then it takes these antigens that are on the surface and packages them and puts them uh, to present to other parts of your immune system. And so this uh, graphic has the T cell uh, learning what that antigen is. And so now we have a receptor on a T cell that recognizes the next cell that has uh, this antigen at the surface. And so now it can recognizes this as foreign and kills the cell. The problem is cancer is your own cells. It's, it's your own body. So it's just a, a body cell that has mutated. It's not infected. So uh, cancers, uh, so they're harder to recognize and your cancers actually have ways that we'll talk about in a second to sort of evade your immune system. And, and we didn't know that until very recently. And so the immune system can find cancers by either seeing uh, uh, tumor-specific antigens on their surface unique to the cancer cells or molecules that we have in our body but used in a different way, proteins uh, that are used in a different way by cancer cells. And so we, we, we rely on that. So this slide, what it starts at the bottom here. Where is it? Uh, so a cell in a tumor dies and it releases antigens that your, your body has certain cells that pick up these antigens and presents them to other cells to uh, form antibodies against. And we're seeing that here in a lymph node. So these are T cells that are learning that these are foreign invaders, just like that previous slide. These T cells go back into the bloodstream and come, hopefully come back to the tumor and recognize that it's this is that antigen that it was presented with and it will kill the cell. 
this happens naturally. This happens all the time, but it only happens at a very low level for a wide variety of reasons. Because the cancers have mutated so much, they've sort of changed the biology of this normal interaction that would happen to infection cells. Tumor cells are mutated. They're, they're doing things in a disorganized manner. So how, the way, uh, how they can get by the immune system is they can no longer express certain receptors. So they don't have receptors to, to bind to. So the T cell has nothing to bind to. Or they release uh, uh, cytokines into the tumor area that de, uh, uh, deregulate the lymphocytes, meaning they, they shut down uh, the T cell function. Or they bind to the T cell uh, uh, surface and what would have been a normal function of uh, another type of immune cell, cancer mimics and, and shuts down uh, the uh, this, these peripheral T cells. So it has a bunch of different ways to get past your immune system so it doesn't isn't recognized as foreign. So we realized that and we said, well, how do we make that to our advantage? How do we prevent the cancer cells from uh, evading our own immune system? And could we ramp up the immune system to fight against these cancers? And that's what uh, immunotherapy uh, is. And so is this the new next steps? Is this the new, and is this uh, the frontier? Well, actually it's a really old therapy. So if you look at the date on this New York Times article from uh, July 29th, 1908, uh, this uh, Dr. Coley uh, injected tumors with uh, Coley's toxin. I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But in this, the sub -head headline was, I thought was fascinating. Uh, he's used it for 15 years to tr uh, treated 430 cases with 150 sure cures. Like that is impressive, though probably false. And so what is Coley's toxin? Well, it's uh, pretty gross. It's uh, meat water, salt, peptone, which are, it's just like a protein mixture. Essentially, it's a medium for bacteria to grow. And he grew the bacteria and then in, uh, injected them into uh, uh, the tumors. He was a he's a orthopedic oncologist uh, at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, and he found that when he injected his patients with those tumors, the tu the tumors would shrink. The problem with that is his reporting was not very good. You know, his daughter reported fifty percent remission rate with this, and then. This is, if you recall, this is a pre-antibiotic area. So we didn't have antibiotics to treat the infections that he's injecting patients with. So people would die from sepsis. And looking back through history, we, we think that people have done this for millennia. Uh, the uh, ancient Egyptian physician Imhotep uh, in uh, 2600 BC will, uh, put in, you know, poultices inside tumors. And so there was some documentation that this happened a long time ago. I, I don't think it worked that well, but it clearly worked enough where it was documented. So the thing that surprised me when I, 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 I researched this is that this Coley's toxin was being produced since uh, until 1952. So they were using this to some extent uh, until very recently. Park Davis stopped producing it in 1952. And then in 1963, the FDA uh, said it's not approving cancer therapy. And then a couple of years later, the American Can Cancer Society called it uh, an unproven method for cancer management. So essentially quackery, you know, they it sort of lost uh, interest. And so people actually didn't really look at it, like I said, because we didn't really understand the immune system and we thought the, this there hadn't, there was no basis for treatment for this. But now 120 years later, we actually found a, a drug uh, called ipilimumab in 2011. It took 120 years because, like I said, we didn't really understand how the immune system worked. T cells were, were first discovered fairly recently in 1968. And then we realized what the different T cells did. And then we uh, figured out how they, the T cells worked. And so this here is really how an immune response works. We need recognition first, activation, and then we'll have uh, the attack on, on the, the tumor. So now our focus is on T cells recognizing cancer cells as foreign. How do we do that? And so in general, there are actually a lot of classes of immunotherapy, but these are the, the main classes. We've tried a lot of different things uh, in the past that have not worked. These are sort of the new frontier uh, and there are actually even more that are coming uh, all the time. Uh, I'll explain what these are. CTLA-4 inhibition, PD-1 uh, inhibition, CAR-T therapy. Um, the first two 
are used right now. I, I'm fairly uh, very familiar with these first two. These other three are are very specific. They're uh, rarely used right now because we're still trying to figure out how to do them safely. I'll talk about that in a second. But they're only done at specialized centers. So these first two we use uh, extensively now. These uh, last three we probably will be using in the future. So uh, CTLA-4 was a protein discovered in 1987, and uh, we uh, eventually found uh, that when you inhibit CTLA-4 uh, in mouse models, uh, sarcoma and colon cancers uh, would shrink. We actually thought when we first found CTLA-4 that it would rev up the immune system, it would cause the immune system to expand. And we thought that uh, this drug, ipilimumab, was an agonist, so it would further ramp up the immune system. Like I said earlier, we want to ramp up our own immune system to, to uh, fight cancer. So they thought this is how they did it. And that's actually how they got their patent for this uh, through uh, this mechanism. Now we realize that it was CTLA-4, this protein, would put a stop to your immune system. It actually shut down your immune system in the tumor. And the ipilimumab would release that inhibition. So this is like one instance where we're wrong twice, but that made a positive outcome. So that worked out well for us. And the problem with CTLA-4 is that it unleashed general activation of T cell response. So this Yervoy drug has a lot more side effects than the next classes that we'll talk about because your whole uh, T cell immune system is revved up throughout your body. So the next uh, development was what other things on uh, cancer cells can we sort of exploit to allow our immune system to, to fight cancers, excuse me. <coughs> so there is a, a receptor that we saw earlier in one of the graphics called programmed cell death one, PD1. And it's on T cells, but it's also on uh, certain cancer cells, lung cancer being one of them. And so in T cells, when that receptor is bound, it actually shuts down the T cell. But for cancer cells, it actually prevents their death. It prevents apoptosis. So the cancer cells love this because it does two things for them. It grows the tumor and it shuts down the immune system. So they figured out, well, let's put uh, uh, something to block that receptor. So in 2014, uh, we developed nivolumab and uh, pembrolizumab. That's a typo, sorry. And then in 2016, we inhibited the ligand itself with atazolizumab. And so... This is much more specific than CTLA-4, so there's a lot less side effects with these. So if we use these as a single agent, it's uh, very well tolerated. I'll talk about side effects at the end. And so they said, well, if we can figure out how to keep your, uh, get your immune system, your T cells specifically, uh, to be uh, to recognize these cells, so that's with the PD-1 and the uh, CTLA-4 uh, receptors, what if we don't have one of those targets? Well, they, that's where CAR-T was developed. So it's a chimeric antigen receptor uh, where your uh, patient's T cells are drawn out of their body and manipulated to uh, put a domain on it from a B cell receptor. And so what that does is that your T cells are already activated without recognizing the self. So it can find uh, cancerous cells uh, usually in hematologic malignancies, but we're looking at it in solid tumor. And uh, if the uh, the diagram at the bottom is uh, where we see that we modify the patient's T cells. These are the new receptors. We inject it back into the body and essentially uh, they are uh, better at recognizing cancer cells and are already activated. So they're, uh, they bypass the tumor's uh, microenvironment where it tries to shut down the immune system. The problem with this is this cytokine release syndrome. So this is done in universities uh, right now uh, where we would do it as, as at University of Maryland. And the reason they do it there is that it's in the intensive care unit because this cytokine release syndrome is uh, essentially your immune system attacking everything all at once. It's not, it, it doesn't happen every time, but because there's that risk of it, we have to be very careful with it. A similar treatment is called this uh, bispecific cell engagers or bites. Uh, these are essentially linkages between T cells that are activated and a specific receptor on uh, the tumor cell. And so it's already activated and all it has to find is the specific site on the tumor cell and it will uh, uh, 
try to kill that cell. And so we uh, have uh, a couple of agents now for refractory disease, meaning diseases that we've gone through all the regular lines of chemotherapy for, and we don't have any other options. Uh, these are now available, but again, at uh, universities because of that uh, cytokine response. So we're still trying to figure out how do we uh, have the market immune response against the tumor or the cancer, uh, but not against yourself. And we're still trying to figure out that out for these newer ones. So these are very new. And then the, the, the last very new group is vaccine therapy. So we've tried this for uh, decades. Um, there is actually one approved uh, vaccine therapy for uh, cancer called Cipulis LT for prostate cancer. It's a antibody, uh, sorry, a vaccine against the prostatic acid uh, phosphatase, but it's not as effective as we thought it would be. It was very labor intensive to make, and we don't really understand the mechanism of how it induces cell death. Uh, so it's not a, a, a treatment that we use in very active disease. But the with COVID, we have now these new classes of mRNA vaccine. And so uh, we actually, from this summer, we have a trial from uh, Moderna with, uh, along with pembrolizumab, a new uh, melanoma uh, vaccine that had positive results and a phase three is planned next year. So this might be our next uh, 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 treatment, uh, immunotherapy treatment that we use uh, in the offices, but it's still not ready for prime time. And uh, if I could jump in yeah. here real quick to, uh, to uh, explain to everybody. So that is a vaccine that you give after you have the disease, once you have the disease. Yeah. That's what not the preventative vaccines that we right. think of that that everybody else gets, and so we do have vaccines that prevent cancer. Um, you know, that's HPV, and uh, uh, which is a wonderful thing. But um, and that is B, and uh, but we don't have this. Is a, a vac people think of vaccines as giving them before the, yep. the fact. This is not a preventative vaccine. It's an after after you've been diagnosed vaccine. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. This is to get your immune system to recognize these cells as abnormal. And so uh, in practice, uh, this graph graphic is really just uh, expanding on the PD-1. It's It shuts down T cells and activates cancer cells. But in practice, these immunotherapies are actually very well tolerated. Um, I'll, I'll speak from experience from the metastatic lung uh, cancer standpoint, but usually it's every three or four weeks uh, in a peripheral IV here in our office. So it's an IV. We don't have to put a port in. Uh, minor infusion reactions can happen, which is sweating or mild shortness of breath during the infusion, but they're usually very mild. And in fact, uh, we rarely even get called about them because they can be, you turn off the drug for a few minutes and uh, can restart it without uh, uh, further problems. And there are new agents being approved all the time. So just in, again, this summer, uh, a new agent for uh, lung cancer was approved. So now it has category one data and we have that now in our, our quiver. Cost remains an issue with this this entire group. Uh, you know, the a single dose of pembrolizumab is uh, almost eleven thousand dollars, and so again, with the newer immunotherapies, cost will be a, an issue as well because again, these are at big centers requiring intensive care stays. So these are all uh, not cheap, and so that is uh, continue to be a uh, an issue for all 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 oncology treatments for that matter. And so this is a graphic of uh, what the PDL1 inhibitors do. So this is the interaction that we saw in the previous sl a slide where a tumor cell binds to the PD1, it shuts down the T cell and uh, uh, prevents the tumor cell from being killed. Well, these agents, either the ligand uh, spot gets blocked or the receptor gets blocked and that interaction is no longer there. So it allows a T cell to recognize this as a foreign cell and kill the tumor cell. So unfortunately, we can't use immunotherapy for every cancer. We're hoping we're, there are trials, uh, like I said earlier, for uh, going on to see how effective they are in all types of cancer. It was a, it was a game changer for melanoma. Uh, you know, the melanoma was uniform, metastatic melanoma specifically, was a uniformly fatal disease. Uh, uh, President Carter is a, a wonderful example of where his life expectancy probably would have been weeks to months, and now it's been years that he's been on this therapy. Uh, in non-small cell cancer, it's also been a, a, a game changer. We use it 
uh, not only in the metastatic setting, but also a adjuvant setting as well, or after chemotherapy, we'll do it to uh, ensure remission. Renal cell cancer, we use it pretty routinely now. Um, in other types of cancers, it's very specific whether we can use it or not. In colorectal patients, you have to have a certain mutation that is a, a, a low likelihood, but in certain patients, we can use immunotherapy. Similarly, with uh, bladder, hepatocellular, head and neck, uh, breast cancer, all of those are very specific use cases. But we are still ongoing uh, doing trials. Trials are ongoing to expand indications for you. So I, I think that we'll be hearing this slide will be a lot busier in the coming year. I didn't put a lot of these types of slides in, but I just want to show you that you know overall survival in melanoma, sometimes you can combine two separate immunotherapies. So this green line here is uh, nivolumab by itself. This blue line is ipilimumab by itself. And uh, this red line is them together. So what we're looking at is percent overall survival over time. And so we're, you know, this is one year, this is two years, we're going out to three years, you know, so uh, we're getting uh, very good responses with our immunotherapies. And sometimes we can use different mechanisms together. This is what we've done with chemotherapy as well, but now we're doing it with immunotherapies. And then just similarly, the previous standard of care was a drug called sudanitinib, uh, for kidney cancer, now just nivolumab plus ipilimumab uh, has uh, marked Im improvement in survival. And again, you're talking about years now uh, where that probably was not the case 20 years ago. So th these are it's a great class. I, I think it's very exciting, but there are side effects of immunotherapy. Fortunately, uh, for all of us, they're not usually severe side effects except for the newest ones it can really affect any organ. And so you'll see a lot on, on this, a lot of itis. Itis just means inflammation. So it's essentially your immune system is primed to attack the tumor, but it can also attack our normal cells. So, uh, you know, common side effects are rashes. So uh, uh, skin uh, can be affected by these immunotherapies. So people can develop rashes. Uh, the colon causing colitis. So diarrhea can be a common side effect, but usually it's fairly well controlled. Pneumonitis, it's sometimes hard to know if patients have a pneumonia or is this a side effect of the chemo, uh, the immunotherapy? Is this pneumonitis, inflammation of your lung tissue? And so, uh, so it's monitoring. We uh, while patients are being uh, treated, we'll monitor them uh, prior to each therapy and see uh, are there side effects that they're getting. How do we treat them? Most of these are very uh, minor and uh, well controlled. How we treat them is with steroids. So you're revving up your immune system and it's attacking the wrong thing. So we give them steroids to calm down that immune response. There are a lot of different mechanisms why we think uh, these uh, reactions can happen in various organs, but we don't really quite understand it. Again, it's the immune system is still very complex and there's a lot of moving parts. So uh, we don't know exactly why, but uh, we have a good track record of treating these side effects uh, with steroids or uh, giving people tr uh, treatment holidays, taking a break from the treatment while they recover from side effects. It's unusual that we have to take a long uh, break or uh, take somebody off therapy because of a side effect, which was not the case for standard chemotherapies. And so uh, research continues with all of these things. Um, we still don't know why some patients don't respond to immunotherapy. We think that there are probably other pathways that we don't know about yet that are contributing to this. Um, but we're using immunotherapy, you know, maybe three years ago, I was only using it in metastatic patients. And now we're using it uh, sooner and sooner. So I think it's to the benefit of all of our patients. And it's just one more tool in uh, the fight against cancer. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was yeah. terrific. That took a very complex topic, and I think, at least for me, it made it a lot uh, good. good. <laughs> simpler I, is I, it's a relative term because it is yeah, a yeah. very complex topic, but it's an yeah. important one and it's a great one. I think it's going to, you know, um, uh, 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 move into many other fields of medicine. Agreed. This is one that's really, really very important. Um, I have a few questions myself. If anybody 
else uh, who's been who's participating wants to, uh, you can uh, put a question in the chat and be happy to uh, read it out and answer that as well. Um, but uh, a couple of questions that I had. Uh, so first of all, one of the things, but what do you do? You know, uh, cancer is more common in people who have immune dysfunction or, immu yeah. or you know, suppressed, right? Because they yep. don't have the, the standard immunity to fight it off at the very beginning. Yeah. So in somebody who has a cancer due to an immunosuppression, are, you know, are these therapies valid and worthwhile in somebody like that? It still would be. So we, even if we think we got a secondary cancer after immune, immune suppression for any number of things, we still think it's the tumor microenvironment that's important for this. And so these immunotherapies still should work. Great. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you said that, that, that you know, there's these select cancers that it does work in. Yeah. There's, you know, I get I have people with you know things like pancreatic cancer, which yeah. is always looking for, but right. there are other ones, ovarian, you know, other ones that you know you want to use um, for for other cancers. Do you have any sense as to why it isn't? Is it that it, we haven't found the right antigens yet? That they don't express antigens or don't have antigens? I, I, don't I, cause I just think response? we haven't found the right one. I think that you know for for lung cancer we found this PD uh, PD one PDL one uh, interaction that so we see that that's an interaction that's very specific to that tumor microenvironment. And so we've exploited that. I think it's really just doing more research and finding uh, more targets. Uh, yeah, that'd be great to answer. Yeah. That would be really, there's still more out there to be, be heard from. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And uh, one person wrote, uh, what about immunotherapy for prostate cancer? Yeah, and so uh, I, I I haven't treated anyone for uh, with immunotherapy for prostate cancer. I unfortunately don't know where we are in trials for this. Um, uh, again, we have superior cell T, which is a type of immunotherapy. That's the uh, uh, vaccine uh, treatment that I, I alluded to earlier. Um, but I don't know if whether we can use Keytruda for prostate cancers. I, I, it's not approved as of right now. What about in it for um, palliative or you know somebody who's really failed many other things? Can you go to immunotherapy at that point for? You know, I talked about this in NGS, next generation sequencing. PDL one is one of the markers on there. So sometimes if we get through multiple lines of therapy, we'll end up saying uh, we'll see some certain markers that aren't approved of uh, for that specific disease type. But if we get to a refractory state where we sort of used all of our agents, we can sometimes appeal to insurance companies to say, well, the, their sequencing show that they have this, can we try that that agent? And oftentimes we'll be able to get it. It's not a guarantee though, that's the hard part because these are all very expensive drugs. Right, right. And, and you know, this is probably, you know, case by case, but do you Correct. success yeah. with those? Are you using it in that situation? What's that? You find success if you're, if you're using it more as yeah. a last... Right. Uh, last effort did you find it, it has happened i mean it, there have been times where we got the least time out of it the hard part there's a lot of things going on at that point if we're if we're on last lines of therapy so there's a lot of moving parts there sure um and then uh, uh martha harris wrote uh where are these treatments being done today um and specifically yeah. where in our area yeah and so um uh our practice is a fairly large practice we have seven offices all throughout the area and we have three oncologists, I have five breast surgeons, a thoracic on, uh, oncologist. So we do our immunotherapies here in the office. So um, uh, the the first two, meaning CTLA four and PDL one. The other ones, uh, the the riskier ones, CAR T and the bite cell, uh, the bite therapy, those are done at universities. So the standard immunotherapies we can do here in our offices. Uh, the m more aggressive ones are at Hopkins and and uh, University of Maryland. At Georgetown or GW? Uh, you know, so as far as for CAR T, I don't believe so. Really? Yeah. Georgetown gets into that. Okay. Yeah. Alma mater is letting me down. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Yeah, that's right. And then another question uh, about, uh, I believe it's about prostate cancer is uh, how is immunotherapy distinguished from hormone therapy? Yeah. I mean, so hormone therapy can be uh, either from prostate cancer or breast cancer, for example. We have estrogen receptor, or progesterone receptor. So uh, hormone therapy are are directed against the receptor. So it's more like 
I, I think rituxan was one of the the examples I gave. It's a CD20 uh, monoclonal antibody, an antibody against a surface uh, receptor. It's not using your own immune system. It's sort of saying this drug has this uh, targets this receptor, so it goes and binds with that receptor and kills the cell. So that hormone uh, receptor uh, gets uh, the the drug attached to it. Immunotherapy is using trying to get your T cells to do that job. So not having the drug attached to the the cell, the uh, abnormal cancer cell, it's having a T cell attached to that abnormal cell and killing it. Does that make sense? I think I think the and correct me if I'm wrong, but my, yeah. my understanding, at least uh, from the uh, prostate cancer, yeah, uh, and well, I guess and, and breast cancer is that yeah. also that these are hormone responsive. Correct. Tumors. Yeah. So They're for like prostate... suppressing the hormone, you know, to get uh, the anti estrogen aromatase inhibitors. Or, uh, and and same thing with Lupron, you know, it's anti testosterone. So it's cutting off the prostate cancer cells from testosterone, which kills the cells. Right. It's the it's sort of the same kind of PDL. It's it's the things that stimulate the growth. You stop right. that thing from That's being right. there, which is the hormone. Exactly. Slow down the growth of the, of the tumor. Yeah. Um, yeah so. Um, yeah, so good. Yeah, well, this was very, very enlightening and, and helpful. Um, and uh, I'll just say from my experience, uh, it is absolutely astounding what I've seen, even just in the last five years. Yeah. We were just talking about this before we started, how many patients I have that have metastatic melanoma, metastatic yeah. lung cancer, um, and are now living normal, metastatic renal cell cancer, and are living relatively normal lives or completely normal lives. Mm -hmm. Whereas 10 years ago, these would have been absolute death sentences within months. And uh, they're- And I'll add to that. Maybe this will be the most helpful thing that I say is, you know, when you Google these things, the data for survival is very old data. Meaning this is back when we're using standard chemotherapy and not any of the new agents that we've been using since, you know, 2010. So people will see a prognosis and it's very different than what it actually is. We just don't have that data yet this long experience to say this is the new uh, data. So just take Google with a grain of salt. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I say that many times a day. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, this is, this is very exciting and it's really amazing. The people who, who qualify for it and get it yep. and get benefit from it, it it's um, you know a new lease on life. And so it's absolutely yeah. fun stuff. So uh, yeah, so this is a really important subject. I really appreciate you uh, giving us the uh, details on that and uh, hopefully making it a little bit more clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it, This is a very complex subject. I mean, I think that it's a, it's a little bit hard because there's so many moving parts. We have immunology, which is very complex. We have oncology, which is very complex, and then trying to mesh the two. So it's, it's a, a, hopefully there's a little bit more understanding that you can at least get some of the vocabulary words when you read about it. Uh, we're fortunate to have people smarter than me, like you, doing this, so that yeah. I don't have to try to understand it. Now. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think there was one one more question here. We'll sure. take this as the last one. It says, um, Dr. Nainan, how do you know immunotherapy is working for a BRCA1 patient? Yeah. It, immunotherapy so Prembro may have triggered a very large ulcer formation in my duodenum. Uh, yeah. And so, I mean, this is the hard part about the side effects is the itises that we can get with immunotherapy is sort of the bad side. You know, if it's used in uh, patients with certain mutations as a preventative, uh, the likelihood of developing cancer is extremely low. Sometimes we'll do sort of surveillance scans every so often, rarely, meaning like once a year or so, just to make sure we're on the right track. Uh, unfortunately, I think you got one of the problems with the immunotherapy is that it sort of attacked your body as uh, foreign, uh, because we try to rev up your immune system to fight your cancer, to prevent cancers from forming. And so, uh, it would be this, the standard, uh, screening that you should always be doing mammograms. Um, you know, if you have a risk of ovarian cancer, tumor markers, things like that. Yeah, we, I was described your immune system as walking at an incredibly narrow knife edge. That's right to an over revving just a little bit to one side or under revving it just a little bit to the other side yeah. cause disastrous results. And so, yeah. you know, but, but you, have, you know, you need to manipulate it in, in certain yeah. cases. And, so and we realize it's a that's very that's powerful tool. tool. Yeah. It's, it's a very powerful tool, but also it comes with, comes very with dangerous. Science. Yeah. Right. So, um, well, thank you very much. I really yeah. appreciate your time and for uh, giving us this lecture. This was terrific. Um, 
And I thank uh, you to everybody who attended. We really appreciate it. Um, we will also be posting this on our website. So if uh, you know somebody who wanted to see it and wasn't able to attend tonight, they'll be able to see this uh, probably in a few days uh, on our website. And again, remember, if you come to an appointment, we are at our new location. So please don't go to our old one. But uh, we're looking forward to seeing everybody in the new space. I uh, hope you all have a good night. And uh, thanks again. Great. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah,